but not too much, because I'm going to ask you to boldly go with Kevin Fong, who um, has done a number of TV programs on uh, extreme environments. And um, I first heard Kevin speak at Cambridge University about the difficulties of going to Mars. And Kevin has just told me he's about to fly with the air ambulance. Uh, Kevin is a, um, an anaesthetist and... I can't say that either. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but has been involved very much with space medicine and human factors and, you know, the sort of things that are going to happen to us when we get, when we, medically and physically, when we go into space. So, Kevin Fong. Thank you all. Um, so, it takes a bit of explaining, really, wh why I end up talking about space and stuff. So, I, I started out life uh, at UCL studying astrophysics, so, you know, the same area as, as Lucy. Uh, and then while I was at university, I realised that medical students were really stupid, so I could probably go to medical school as well. So, I went to medical school. Uh, and, uh, and I was very lucky, and I thought that was it. I thought, I thought I would become a GP and wear a cardigan and a pair of sandals and, and live out in the West Country. But the thing that had driven my interest in science as a child had always been at space. You know, the first memory I have is 1975, uh, watching, I was four years old, uh, watching uh, the Apollo Soyuz, that makes me 42, just in case you can't do the math, uh, watching this Apollo Soyuz test product, pro project in space. It was the last mission of the Apollo era, and my parents woke me up in the middle of the night to watch these modules docking in space, and you know, uh, I didn't understand what I was seeing, but I just knew it was very special. And I think that's really what drove my enthusiasm for science and gave me the career, the very random career, but the career that I enjoy today. Um, uh, I, because of that, when I finished medical school, I went back uh, and applied to NASA to work with Medical Operations Group. Uh, and I did that for a while, on and off, and I ran this sort of double life where I was going to uh, I'd come off a shift as a junior doctor, I'd fly across the ocean and go and sit in a room uh, and talk straight, basically, uh, about whether or not we could get to Mars or not. And this talk is slightly about that, about that double life that I always had. And, and I, I felt very uncomfortable about it, actually, because you go out of a very strained healthcare system and go sit around with people talking about spunking a, you know, a couple of hundred billion dollars going to Mars. And you wonder, well, you wonder if it's worth doing, actually, don't you? Uh, and, 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 and so the question... Well, doing, <laughs> well, well, well you, 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 may, you may think that I would think that it was worth doing, but I do have my doubts. Um, uh, I, I, and so I get this, that's what this is about, right? So the question that we're going to ask, start with, and, and I don't have the answer to it, and we can talk about it either in questions afterwards or later, is, is this the end of human exploration? Should you continue? Is this a time like no other in human history? Are we done exploring stuff? Because we're done on this planet exploring stuff. And I know you're going to say the oceans and stuff, but basically there is very little in the way of white space on, on the surface of the physical Earth, you know. And when you wind back 100 years, there is, there's a lot of it, right? This time 100 years ago, just before this time 100 years ago, there are lots of places where no human footstep has ever been. South polar region, summits of our highest mountains, Mariana Trench, etc., etc. And yet we take it all on, and the skies, and then we go into space and off to the moon, and we're there and we've done that. And the question is, what happens next? Now, I've become very interested, actually, in how fast we move. And if you look at the century that we've just come through, it feels extraordinarily fast if you think about it properly. Um, because a century, I think, growing up, you have that's a long period of time, but actually it's 10 decades. And that period of time now, for a child born today, is within the life expectancy of a child born in this country with only slightly better than average luck. So you one in three to one in four chance of making your 100th birthday if you're born today in this country. Uh, and so in that context, the 10 decades that have passed have been very short, and yet we've come an awfully long way. And I'm glad that people talked about Edgar Mitchell. Edgar Mitchell was the, one of the oldest, I think the oldest Apollo astronaut. And, and as a sign of how far we've come is that my favorite quote of any of the astronauts, I think, was his when he said um, in one of his interviews, 
When I was five, the barnstormer came to my farm and I thought it was the greatest thing I'd ever seen. When my son was five, I walked on the moon. He didn't think it was a big deal. <laughs> and, and you know, and that is sort of quite amusing, but actually also tells you how far and how ready to expect the future we, we, we've become. Um, when you talk about the moon, and so it's interesting as well that we've tried to leave out Apollo from the story of the Republic of the Moon, partly, I would suspect, uh, because that's all you ever talk about when you talk about the moon, partly actually subconsciously, I think, because we're a bit embarrassed about it. And I think that we're a bit embarrassed about it because of what it was in context. And we sit here inspired by it, we sit here um, you know, drawing uh, inspiration from Apollo, from that exploration. Lucy showed that very beautiful photograph of the Apollo 8 Earth rise. But in context, it was a terrible thing. Uh, and Gil Scott Heron, I was going to try and get a, a recording of Gil Scott Heron's very famous poem of this time, uh, Whitey on the Moon, which is his anger at the fact that millions and millions of, millions and millions and millions and millions of American tax dollars were spent, 0.5% of the American GDP over the period of the Apollo project was spent on sending people into space when people were and continue to starve or be unable to afford health care. And that's just the start of the complexity. When you look at the people who were the architects of Apollo, you know, who were they? Why does Kennedy do that? So in this day and age of YouTube, you should all go and watch Kennedy's speech, 1962, Rice University, the before this decade is out speech. Because for most people, all they know of that speech is before this decade is out, we will send a man to the surface of the moon. That's pretty much all anyone knows. But that's a speech of some 12 to 15 minutes in length. And it's an amazing piece of oration. It makes you realize how much we've lost that skill of oration. And it's brilliant, really, in many ways, partly because of the scale of the ambition. Uh, he says, you know, we do these things because they're hard. To do these things, we'll have to invent materials. We ha we'll have to invent materials, some of which don't exist currently. I mean, that's the scale of that ambition. Um, it's amazing because he stands in a stadium full of people and says, here's what we're going to do. There's this crazy-ass thing which involves going out there a long, long way that no one's ever done before, and it's going to cost a shed load of money, uh, basically your money, and we're going to do it. And everyone stands up and goes, brilliant, great idea, great idea. Um, and that's amazing that everyone followed into it, but there are some myths about the moon. We did go there. Um, that's not one of the myths. And, and, uh, and my second favourite quote of the Apollo astronauts is uh, someone asked John Young. He, he, uh, someone once pimped him and said, you know, did you really go to the moon? And he turned, or did, you, or did you fake it? And I think it was him who said, well, we may have faked it, but uh, I was sitting on top of the stack that day when they lit it, and I definitely went somewhere. Uh, <laughs> but the, the, but the, the, the myths about the moon uh, or about our, the public attitude towards lunar exploration was everyone says the received narrative is that everyone was really into it in the 1960s and then everyone got bored of it and now no one's interested in it because it's got boring and actually Murray polls that were taken around the time and since show that approval for a project Apollo never reached 50% amongst members of the United States until they landed on the moon, and then it nudged over the top for a couple of weeks and went back down again. So actually, people weren't as in love with the moon, even when we were landing on it, as people try and remember. The second thing is that we didn't get bored of it, because approval ratings for shuttle just climbed and climbed. And by the time shuttle was finished, everyone said, oh, it's boring, it's boring. But actually, certainly in the United States, its approval rating was between 60 and 70% consistently. So we, the things that we think are true are not necessarily true. Now, why did we go to the moon? Uh, well, we went to the moon because it was a surrogate battlefield for a war that couldn't be fought in any other way. We know that. Uh, and the people who were the architects of that project, the Saturn V architects, some of them were, I, I mean, you know, some of them certainly had been around during some of the worst human atrocities in the 20th century uh, at Pini Moons. And if they weren't part of it, they were aware it was going on and did nothing, obviously, to stop it. Some of them were, as far as I can tell, card-carrying Nazis until the day they died. And yet, we celebrate them in a revised history as, you know, Hermann Oberth is one of those people. Uh, you know, he's got, he probably never stopped having Nazi sympathies, if you 
depending on which sources you read. And yet he's always the godfather of rocket science and all of our, our terrorists. So it's pretty dark. This stuff comes from a dark place. The Redstone uh, Mercury uh, capsules were launched out of part of the Redstone Arsenal. The Redstone Arsenal was an evolved concept from the V2 rockets. So all of that stuff, the reason I think that we are reluctant to put Apollo into this narrative here is because we're trying to look forward with vision and inspiration when actually it comes from some of the darkest places in the 20th century. Uh, and, and, and while we painted vision all over the top of it, and Kennedy did very well with that, actually it was a pragmatic geopolitical move, which Kennedy, by the way, tried to move away from as fast as he could once he'd put the goal in motion. So where does that leave you? Um, the first question is, is, well, is Apollo different? Was Apollo worth doing, or was it just an aberration? It was described, and I can't ever find out who the attributable source is. But someone said that Apollo was an aberration, that it turned up about a century too soon, that, that it was a piece of the 21st century that was dragged, kicking and screaming into the 20th century, which is why we went and then we never went back, because it was just too hard to do, and it was done too soon. And that's accepted by a lot of people, except for it, that is the way that most exploration is. And in fact, all of that darkness there is in the exploration of the moon is the darkness, I think, that there is in all of exploration. And I think the motivation for exploration has never been as romantic as anyone, at least historically, thinks. Uh, I think we superimpose that romantic narrative only in the future. And I, I'd put it to you, actually, that the exploration of any time doesn't make sense to the rational people of the same time. Because when you look back at the, uh, the episodes of exploration, great exploration of the past, it's the same story. It's some imperial power lost leading that effort through their, their nation, usually their military, at great expense, at great risk to human life. And as an illustration of that, I'll give you the Magellan circumnavigation of the globe between 1518 and 1521. So Ferdinand Magellan, uh, how many of you, I, look, I won't ask. Most of you, I'm sure, have heard that name. Most of you might on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire say, uh, who was it who circumnavigated the first circumnavigation of the globe? You say Ferdinand Magellan. There's much more to that story than that. And it's this. 1518, uh, Ferdinand Magellan, son of Portugal, can't convince Portugal to let him sail around the world, so he goes over to the rival Spain, and he sails with five ships and about 283 sailors. Uh, and he sets off for a circumnavigation. And they have a tough time, because going around the world on, the, on naval exploration it is about as hard as going to Mars is today. En route, they have not one, not two, but three mutinies. Uh, many people desert the expedition, uh, and they lose a number of ships, uh, four out of the five ships, actually. Uh, Magellan himself doesn't complete the expedition. He dies over a misunderstanding with some natives in Polynesia uh, before the expedition is complete. And so when the expedition returns to port in 1521, it has one ship, the Victoria, and 18 sailors aboard it. So this is an expedition that loses 80% of the vehicles and 90% of its crew, which is a disaster even by modern NHS proportions, I would say. So, so, so and what actually the point I'm trying to make is that we remember that for all time as the first great adventure in naval history to go around the world, and it was important. We recognize it universally as an important stepping stone that took us on to the future. And yet, I put it to you that if you were a deckhand sitting in the port of San Car de Barada as it came in, limping back into port in 1521, you would have not said, brilliant, what a romantic and inspiring thing. You would have gone, where are all my mates, I think. And so I do think that the great exploration of any age doesn't make sense to the rational people of that age. That's why I do understand and sympathize entirely with Gil Scott Heron's lament about what Apollo cost versus what was needed to be done at the time. I think that's the same is true of all of these things. And so that puts you in a really difficult position as someone who loves exploration. What can you love about it? Because I, th I, think, I think that you can only you can only love the exploration of the moment so that people of the future will, you know, vicariously enjoy it on your behalf later. Because at the time, I'm not, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure that you can. 
I, and it does leave you, it does mess with your head quite badly when you get to that point. Um, because it has to happen, exploration has to happen. But, but the people who do it, you probably wouldn't like to have a beer with them. Uh, and, 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 and you probably, I'm taking being taken off stage. Uh, <coughs> so, I wrote a whole book about this, so you can go read that. So, uh, so, uh, so, so um, I, I guess what I'm trying to say here is, is this the point at which human exploration stops? Is this the point at which we realise once and for all that it is too expensive and comes at too high a human price for us to continue? Or, or do we continue into the future much as we have in the past? And I'm not sure. I will leave you with this thought, uh, that the moon is the furthest point we've ever been from the Earth. It's 250,000 miles away. And I'm not sure how history will see Project Apollo. Because it's two options. It will either see it the way that we see Magellan's circumnavigation of the globe as the first step on a much longer journey. Or it will see it like we look at the pyramids, which is this amazing feat, but why the bloody hell did you do that? <laughs> and, 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 and so I am unclear, and I don't think anyone else knows either. Sorry to go on too long, Rob. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Questions uh, for Kevin quickly now as uh, so you've got short time. No? Yes, one there. Sorry to be controversial, but um, the Chinese aren't known for valuing human life. So, what difference does will that make in the future? Because obviously they're the ones who are in the advance at the well, moment. They're going to the moon for the same reasons that you know the Americans went to the moon. It's imperial ambition. To, you know, the, the torch of exploration. Is, is passed from, from sovereign state to sovereign state with the G1 status. That, that's what the Chinese are going to the moon for. You know, you know, you tell Magellan's story, and that's Spain and Portugal who were the G1s of their time. You tell Scott's story, and that's the uh, British story because we're the G1 at that time. Apollo is, is, is an American story because they were G1, and guess who's going to be next? So, you know, China are going to the moon the same way that everyone else has explored everything else. Okay. I'd like to ask you, you're talking about human exploration, but as we know, most of the, uh, the interesting information that we're gathering now is data, and it's not done through the human senses anymore. And so, the real exploration, I would uh, say, will be instrumental exploration and not human exploration. And as somebody, uh, some scientist quote, uh, said, I don't remember who exactly, uh, that for one, for one person going up to space, for the, no, that you could, you could send, I can't remember how many, oh, yes. uh, you know that, so, for the toilet so, so paper, I know, I know, one human So I, I know where you're going with this. Yeah, so, yeah. so this is a big question. I have no doubt that telepresence is going to be a large part of future exploration of even the solar system. Uh, and and the, the discussions they have at NASA are that the future of space exploration is going to be a partnership between robots and humans. It can't be that that dichotomy between humans or automated platforms is slight, somewhat false, although I do agree with you that remote sensing platforms, automated platforms, will be much of what we do. A lot of what Lucy does, staring at the sun, can't really be done by human eyes. So, so there's another thing about that, because there's that old trope that says, well, you know, what's the point? Because robots are going to be doing it. Look at what robots can do. They're going to be doing it all instead of us. And that's kind of not, when you look at actually what the rovers, our most capable rovers are capable of, they're still pretty unimpressive compared to my eight-year-old son. And my eight-year-old son's no prodigy. You say it's prodigy. So, so, so uh, and there's, there's, there's a thing about that, about robotic capability is that the po at the point at which, and it may come, but at the point at which robots are as capable of moving, analyzing, recognizing patterns, and making abstract associations as humans are, you've got a lot more problems to worry about than whether or not they're exploring space for you. <laughs> and, and, and so I, I think, so I think that you are right, that the, the future exploration will be this partnership between machines and humans, but their exploration will always be human at heart, but how that's process.